Yeah, a typical day obviously started at home with me getting up and I used to get up at about uh, half past five, leave the house by shortly after six because by doing that I could beat all the traffic up, uh, all the commuting traffic could in those days anyway I didn't yeah. I don't think leaving at six would do the business now but it did it did back then and I would get to Heathrow at about 7 15 go and have coffee and something to eat and we'd then assemble in crew reporting at about quarter to nine for the 10 30 flight get our briefing half past eight quarter to nine something like that um, have a very thorough briefing, decide on the fuel we're taking, um, look at the weather obviously, any airspace restrictions, all that sort of stuff would be covered then. And you'd then go out to the airplane and typically you'd arrive at the airplane probably about an hour and a half. So you'd get to the airplane at about nine o'clock in the morning. I'd go up into the flight deck, poor old flight engineer would go around and kick the tyres and make sure there was nothing falling off anywhere. And we would then, we the pilots would go through a whole series of checks of our own for the instruments on each side of the flight deck. The flight engineer, when he came onto the flight deck, would do a similar thing with his panel. And then we'd end up in a coordinated sort of series of checklists that led up eventually uh, to the engine start procedure. As far as the passenger boarding was concerned, that would start about half an hour before the chocks away time. So the passengers would typically be boarding from about 10 o'clock, 5 to 10, 10 o'clock onwards. And then at about 10, 15, the dispatcher would come up and say, they're all on board and everything's stowed. And we'd say, sign the load sheet say goodbye to the dispatcher and then get clearance to start our inboard engines because there's no auxiliary power unit on Concorde so you it wasn't until you started an engine that you got any hydraulic or electric power so we had to have that before we push back start the inboards and then we push back on time hopefully at 10 30 with the two inboard engines running and then as we were pushing back We'd start the outboards, park the aeroplane, say goodbye to the tug and the ground engineers and they would chug away in the tug and then you'd get your taxi clearance and out you'd go to the runway and as you were going out to the runway again you'd be doing a whole series of checks, um, literally checking every single system that it was operating. And you'd get to the holding point for the runway, having completed all the checks, wait your turn in the queue, line up on the runway. Uh, lining up was interesting, the flight deck was about 35 feet ahead of the nose wheel. So when you, and you wanted to use all the runway, you didn't want to waste runway in Concorde. You never want to waste runway in any aeroplane as a matter of principle. <laughs> And you come onto the runway at a right angle and you taxi at a right angle until you on the flight deck were sitting overhead the far edge of the runway oh, yeah. if that makes sense yeah. and then you crank in on the nose wheel steering and swing around and you'd be lined up absolutely plumb on the right. center line ah. with minimum wastage of runway yeah. behind you and you'd then hold the position there until you got your, until you, you, you were always cleared to line up to start with and then you get your takeoff clearance and as soon as you got your takeoff clearance you would open the throttles up fully, the reheats would cut in automatically as the engine spooled up and um, the takeoff as I've already mentioned I think it was extremely dynamic, very different from a normal jumbo takeoff. It was all happening, accelerating fast, things happening very quickly. And you had the same sort of key speeds as you do on any conventional um, aircraft. V1, which is the decision speed, below which you can abandon the takeoff yeah. and stop within the remaining length of runway. 
beyond which if you have a problem you've got to take the problem into the air with you and sort it out when you're in the air. Yeah. Then you've got rotate VR which is when you pull back on the control column and present that delta wing at an angle to the airflow to generate the lift to get you airborne. Yeah. And then V2 which is the safety speed and typical sort of speeds um, well 155 is a sort of fairly typical V1 198 a fairly typical sort of rotate speed 220 a fairly typical um, V2 yeah um, once you were airborne uh, you'd have a subsonic climb up to 28,000 feet a short subsonic cruise going over the West Country out to the Bristol Channel yeah. then you get your transonic acceleration clearance open the throttles, reheats on again, climb and accelerate, reheats on until a marked number of 1.7 and then you cut the reheats and coast it up rather more gently from 43,000 feet which is roughly where you reach 1.7 Mach number and you reach Mach 2 at 50,000 feet and you then just leave the throttles wide open and the airplane would cruise climb as you got lighter of course as you burnt the fuel off you'd sort of climb up and eventually you'd reach probably about 58 59,000 feet yeah. on the other side of the Atlantic and you'd then do a deceleration and descent process to bring you back to subsonic flight making sure that you were subsonic at least 55 miles from the coastline so that you didn't land sonic booms on Manhattan mm -hmm. and then once you were subsonic you'd just become part of the subsonic traffic flow just like any other aeroplane and then when it came into the landing a very easy aeroplane to land uh, we'd, we, we used to do what we called reduced noise approaches <coughs> it had a wonderful auto throttle system which was very precise if you wanted 153 knots that's exactly what you got 153 yeah. knots no messing about and what we used to do is we'd come down at 190 knots down to 800 feet so that we were A, travelling faster B, cutting down the noise B, cutting down the fuel used and then at 800 feet we'd plumb in the threshold speed which typically was around 160 knots and then over the next 300 feet as you were descending down the glide slope you'd be shedding 30 knots of airspeed as you went from 190 knots down to 160 knots and then the last 500 feet you'd be coming down on a stable approach and then as you got near the runway that great delta wing was compressing the air between the underside of the wing and the runway surface and it would almost land itself and you'd have main wheel touch down and then lower the nose wheel control column hard forward you've disconnected the auto throttles at this stage by the way control column hard forward and then you come in with the reverse thrust and the wonderful carbon fiber brakes which worked brilliantly well and you could stop the aeroplane very very quickly if you really needed to yeah. and then you taxi to the gate and the passengers would disembark and more often than not they'd disembark say oh I wish the flight could have been a bit longer <laughs> we were enjoying it so much and that really genuinely was the reaction of the great majority of the passengers really? yeah but did a lot of people fly just for the experience no the regulars on the regular flights um, I mean we carried a lot of people from uh, the, the investment banks Goldman Sachs Merrill Lynch yeah. Cantor Fitzgerald poor old Cantor Fitzgerald of course with the lot that virtually had all their staff killed in the dreadful 9-11 yeah. thing they were our regulars but and probably the, the uh, if you're sort of trying to sort of single out the biggest group I would say they were probably the biggest group right. yeah. but then we'd carry politicians I mean I've carried Henry Kissinger dozens and dozens of times um, you carry the great classical musicians um, Pavarotti is somebody I've carried many many times um, and then you'd have all the film stars Paul Newman comes to mind um, 
and and the, and of course the the, the pop mus musicians as well. Yeah. So it, it was a sort of galaxy. It was it was always fascinating to look at a passenger list on Concorde because there were invariably a whole lot of household names that sprung out of the <laughs> out of that passenger list statue. So John, we're here in the Concorde um, cockpit. Could you show us around for us? Okay, well, <coughs> the first thing I always like to say is this is a proper flight deck. None of this poncy glass cockpit rubbish. These are proper instruments, needles and dials. So what we've got here, first of all, the flight instruments. You've got a suite of flight instruments for the captain the left-hand seat being the captain's seat and those instruments are all reproduced for the co-pilot on the right-hand seat and I don't know how whether you can see them clearly or not but the instruments are airspeed indicator that's a standby that that's the airspeed indicator there artificial horizon rate of climb and descent indicator that's a radio altimeter pressure altimeter and another altimeter here, a compass here, and a compass here, and a Mach meter there. And that shows the angle of incidence, that instrument there. And those instruments are all reproduced on the right hand side. In the middle, you've got engine instruments for the four engines. N2s, N1s, EG, fuel flows, EGTs, and the area of the nozzle at the back end of the engine. Coming across here, you've got all this stuff associated with the autopilots. Autopilot switches are there. Auto throttle switches are there. Flight director switches. And you can set the whole thing up for um, coupling up with the inertial navigation systems um, to the autopilot. You do that all through uh, the switchery up here and you also couple it up for um, automatic landings, automatic approaches and landings um, if you're landing in foggy weather at Heathrow. So that's for the, all the autopilot stuff and then coming up here you've got a master warning system and then coming up here, a whole series of instruments, really, well, switches related to various sort of technical um, um, issues to do with hydraulics and, and, and engines. I'm not going to go into all that lot there. And you can't actually see the flight engineer's panel, but maybe we'll get a picture of that uh, later on. But uh, it's without doubt the most complicated flight engineers panel of any civil airliner and one of the reasons uh, the flight engineer was such an important person on the Concorde flight crew was because when you go supersonic with Concorde you create a shock wave and that shock wave forms on the nose as a sort of wall on the nose and as you go from Mach 1 to Mach 2, that shock wave gets deflected backwards. And finally, when you're flying at Mach 2, that shock wave is like a cone radiating from the nose, trailing along behind the aircraft, down to the surface of the Earth, out sideways, and up to the um, upper levels of the Earth's atmosphere. And that shock wave trails along like that behind the aeroplane for the whole time that you're flying supersonic. Now, as that shockwave changes shape from the sort of wall, if you like, and then it gets deflected backwards, what it's doing by changing its shape like that, it's pushing the center of lift back down the wing. And if you didn't do anything about it, you'd end up with the center of gravity where it was, the center of lift having been pushed way, way back here, and you'd end up with a horribly unbalanced aircraft 
uh, wanting to pitch nose down all the time. Which you could correct for aerodynamically if you wanted to, but that would incur sort of drag penalties, which are highly undesirable. So the solution to it, and this is just one of the examples of what a brilliant team, and I can't emphasize this enough, the team of aerodynamicists and engineers who created this wonderful, wonderful aeroplane were a brilliant team of people, they really were. And one of the solution, and the solution they came up for that particular problem was, hey, if the center of lift moves back down the wing, let's move the center of gravity back with it. And then when it goes subsonic and the reverse process happens as the center of lift moves back forwards again, we can pump that fuel back forwards again. And that's exactly what we used to do. And that was the flight engineer's job was to change the position of the center of gravity. And just to illustrate the amount of the change, by comparison with the position of center of gravity at takeoff, by the time you were flying at Mach 2 and you'd push the center of gravity back by pumping fuel into tank 11 in the tail cone, the center of gravity was about eight or nine feet aft of the position it was in for takeoff. So it was a substantial movement. Um, and it was something that needed to be monitored, obviously, very, very carefully. Very important aspect of the whole thing. Another thing while I'm on the subject of these brilliant engineers and aerodynamicists, because you're going so fast, you're, the airplane, the airframe is being subjected to frictional heating and to heating caused by compression. And the temperature on the skin, on the nose, goes up when you're flying at Mach 2 to a maximum of 127 degrees. That was the limiting temperature, 127 degrees Celsius. That's about 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And you, you could, I could pull back this trim <coughs> up above my head here and actually touch the bare metal of the aeroplane. And I tell you what, you didn't keep your finger there any length of time at all. It was red hot. And the airplane actually expanded by about nine inches, they tell me. So you've got this airframe expanding as you go supersonic and then contracting again as you go subsonic. You can't have that process affecting the passenger cabin. I mean, the passengers would be most disconcerted if they saw the cabin floor sort of stretching and the carpet ripping itself apart. Um, so the whole cabin floor sits on a system of rollers, if you like, so that the fuselage can expand and contract and leave the cabin floor completely unaffected by the whole process. I mean, they were just a brilliant team of people. Like, they, they, they were geniuses, some of them. They really, truly were. The, the brain power that went into this is staggering. No other word for it. So, could, John, could you show us the, the throttles and what the, where the reheats were? Yep. The throttles are here. And I'm unable to move them forward for some reason. They're locked. Um, and I can't unlock them, I don't think. No. Anyway, they're the throttles and the reverse thrust, the little handles there. And you, once you've landed, the throttles are fully closed and you pull back on those reverse thrust levers. And that helps you decelerate on the runway. And then the reheats in the actual airplane that I flew, we're sitting on a prototype Concorde here. And it's a bit different. The instruments are not entirely exactly the same as they were on the airplanes that I used to fly. I've never flown this one at all. Um, the reheat switches in the production airplanes that British Airways flew had piano keys for reheat switches. On this airplane you can see they're just switches, just toggle switches. On the real airplanes that I flew they were nice white piano keys, four of them, 
in line there. And there's a gang bar that you could select them all four up at the same time. And a gang bar to select all four off at the same time. So when you got to the pre-takeoff checks, one of the items would be to select the reheats, pre-select the reheats on. They wouldn't come on because the throttles are at idle at the moment. And then once you started the takeoff run, you'd as you open the throttles up, those reheats would automatically cut in. And off you go, blasting into the air. And at whatever the noise abatement time was, something like a minute and 15 seconds after starting the takeoff would be a typical sort of noise abatement time. The non-handling pilot would go three, two, one noise and the flight engineer would then cancel those reheats and throttle the engines back to a predetermined uh, setting on the throttle quadrant and that would obviously cut the noise level and we'd tiptoe past Windsor Castle so as not to disturb Her Majesty <laughs> and, uh, and then sort of gradually reintroduce full dry power, unreheated power for our climb up to the subsonic cruise altitude. There was also another unique feature was that the nose cone actually moves up and down, doesn't it? Yep, the nose cone does move up and down and there's the control. And there are basically um, four positions for it. The one that it's in at the moment with the nose fully up and the visor, the heat shield, you might be able to see it on the picture You've got a, what you've got here is a conventional windshield like any other aeroplane <clears throat> and then beyond there encased in those heavy duty black bars that you may be able to see is the, the, the visor, the heat shield. So here we are with the nose up and the heat shield in its streamlined position to give the aeroplane a nice aerodynamic shape. The first stage of lowering things is to put that lever down to that detent there and that brings the, no the, the visor down into the nose cone. The next stage is to lower the nose to five degrees, which is that one there. So that then the whole nose cone goes from fully up to five degrees down with the visor stowed inside the nose cone and that's the position that we used to use for taxiing for takeoff and for flying around in the immediate airport area and then the final position is fully down nose 12 uh, 12 degrees down and that was the uh, 12 and a half degrees down actually and that was the position we used for landing and that was part of the landing checks so after you'd selected the undercarriage car down, the next item was nose to 12, no, nose fully down. Um, and the only reason for lowering the nose was to get that great long nose cone out of the pilot's line of sight. Because you're coming into land at about 11 and a half, 11 and three quarters degrees nose up attitude. And if you didn't get that nose cone out of the way, all you'd see, no sign of a runway, just a nose cone, which is not very satisfactory. We were trained during the training, incidentally, to land with the nose stuck in the up position. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, it never, ever happened. It certainly didn't in British Airways. I don't think it ever did in Air France either. And in fact, there was a very... <coughs> effective emergency drill for lowering the uh, for the emergency lowering of the nose which was simply to depressurize the hydraulics and let mr newton's laws of gravi gravity do the business <laughs> so the nose sort of drop down clunk into a nose down position so there we are that's the um that's the reason for the nose cone and the fact that it moves around um, is just simply to give the pilots a decent view of the runway when they're coming into land. Okay, John, do you have any hobbies? Hobbies. Flying is the principal hobby. 
I can actually say that uh, I started my flying in 1955 and here I am in 2017 and I've never had to work in my life. I've been paid to enjoy my hobby, You're a lucky man. Which, is, which is a wonderful thing to be able to say. But um, aside from that, I mean, I loved sailing. Um, we used to have a, a boat, uh, which was great fun. I had an Oster Aglet, going back to the flying theme again, which was a lovely little aeroplane. Um, relied rather on the curvature of the earth to get airborne. But it, again, it was a bit like Concorde in the sense that it was an unforgiving aeroplane. It would make a fool of you if you didn't treat it properly. Yes. And that's, that's a quality I really respect in any aeroplane. Um, photography has been a great um, passion of mine. I've rather given up on it now because I've got fed up with carrying tripods and all this stuff that you have to carry around with you. <laughs> so. I've gone off it now, but I used to do a lot of photography and I sold a lot of photographs commercially for calendars and stuff like that because I've done a lot of trips to Antarctica, for instance. I mean, I love travel um, and I've been three times to Antarctica. And if you've never been to Antarctica, I strongly recommend it as one of the most uh, incredible experiences you'll ever really? have in your life. Mm, I, you mentioned for, um, photography there. Is there anywhere we can find your photos online? I shouldn't think so. No. <laughs> no. no. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a complete dinosaur when it comes to anything to do with modern technology. I, 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 I don't relate well to computers. I don't. I do. I'm, I dip into into all this sort of social media stuff only to keep an eye on my grandchildren and see what they say, what rude comments they're <laughs> posting about their grandparents. <laughs> but for the rest of it, I, I tend to avoid it. I don't, I don't like it. So, um, no, I'm afraid, no, 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 I can't think of any, any way you'd find any of the photographs that I had taken commercially. I mean, I've got so many slides at home. I've got boxes and boxes of them. People would love to get their hands on those, I tell you. <laughs> So do you get to air shows still? I d do go occasionally to air shows. I, I have to say now I've got sort of a bit lazy about it. I mean, I've been to so many air shows. I mean, right, I, I've, I've literally, you won't believe this. When my family came back from India, this is, we're talking about 1950, 51. They had no money they'd left everything behind in India yeah and we they managed to buy the this girls school in Harpenden and that's where we lived it was the family home as well as as well as the family business and we had no car for years we didn't have a car and the way the family used to go on holiday was to cycle everywhere so mum and dad and the four children, ranging from me, who at this stage was about 12, I suppose, down to my youngest sister, who's a few months, she'd go in a sort of, um, in a sort of pannier thing at the back of one of my parents' bicycles. And we used to cycle from Hartenden with one stop somewhere at a youth hostel to the Isle of Wight <laughs> for our holidays. And I used to cycle up. It was always used to be during the time of the Farm Brayer Show, because in those days, the Farm Brayer Show used to be in the summer. I think it's moved to September now. Yes. Um, but it used to be in, in July, uh, right in the middle of the summer. And I was at the Farm Brayer Show when John Derry crashed in the DH-110. Um, so my air show experience goes back 60 years plus, 65 years, um, I have been to a heck of a lot of air shows. And if I do go to an air show now, it tends to be on a very selective basis. I still love seeing them flying around. Um, in a way, I almost prefer the sort of garden party atmosphere of an air show at Shuttleworth at Old Warden, yeah. which is ab I, I mean, one memorable one I went to only a few years ago, and it was a 
gorgeous summer's afternoon going into summer's evening and they trundled out all their basically all their airplanes are flyable at Old Warden and they had the Depard Dusan flying uh, their sort of Avro box kite replicas and all this sort of stuff and I mean that to me is is fantastic and I I love watching that sort of air show because it takes you back into a different into a different age and it's such a in a way a refreshing change from the sort of jet machismo of uh, the fighter jets and so on. Yeah. Why am I saying that when I used to fly Concorde all those years? <laughs> one of the noisiest ones. Which one of the noisiest ones ever? <laughs> so this might be a silly question, but uh, favourite aircraft? Yeah, that's definitely a silly question. You know what I'm going to say to that, do. don't you? Concorde. <laughs> however, however, I am going to also pick out the Spitfire, which I have never flown. And for my 80th birthday, which is coming up next month, uh, my wife and my son are buying me as a birthday present a flight in the Spitfire oh, wow. with a friend of mine who flies them, Cliff Spink, mm -hmm. who's a display pilot on Spitfires and various other historic fighters. And um, he's going to take me up in the twin seat Spitfire and that's going to be the last entry into my logbook. That'll be a pretty special one. That's going to be a very special one, yeah. And finally, do you ever get sick of talking about aviation? I never get sick. I, I, I love talking about aviation to young people to try and inspire them maybe, possibly, into thinking about aviation as a career. I would never ever get tired of talking about Concord. I do innumerable Concord talks. Um, I, I go lecturing all, around, all over the country actually. I've been up as far as uh, Lossiemouth doing talks. I've been as far as um, Devon to do talks. I do it in this country to raise money for the lifeboats who are my great passion. I think they're very brave people, yeah. lifeboatmen and a very special breed of people. And it's also a wonderful charity, by the way. I'm going to do a plug for the lifeboats now, yeah. unashamedly, because it's one of the charities where something like 90% of the money they raise goes to the sharp end of the charity and not for paying of very much overpaid chief executive and a whole team of staff. So I'm a great fan of the lifeboats, partly because of the way they run it, and partly because of the fantastic people who are involved in it. And I should actually also include, I don't specifically raise money for these charities, but you know, anybody who does mountain rescue, anybody who does search and rescue in helicopters, they all come into the same category as the RNLI uh, crewmen. They're very special people who put their lives at risk to rescue people who very often have put themselves in that position through their own stupidity.